My name is Keith Nitka, and I'm proud to be the Battleship Operations Manager here at Nauticus on board Battleship Wisconsin. And I want to thank you for joining me today on this Whiskey Wednesday virtual adventure. On uh, today's Whiskey Wednesday virtual adventure, we got the idea from a guest here on board the ship. The guest had asked about a sailor's language, not the curse words that, that most everybody thinks talking or swearing like a sailor, but the, just the, the everyday language that we use. Uh, some of it has carried over into everyday use. And it got me thinking then uh, about this book in particular and uh, the different phrases that we use in everyday language as well that got their origins in, in the British Navy. That's where the idea for, for this Whiskey Wednesday came about. So thanks for joining us and come on with me and we're going to talk a little bit about that language. Most everybody, if not everyone, is familiar with the term head. Uh, that, of course, being the, uh, the restroom on board a ship. Uh, even if you take a cruise, the restrooms there are labeled as heads. And most everyone, if not everyone, knows head. A sailor can talk to another sailor or a marine, and we can speak to each other using that language most people don't know. Uh, so one of the things is rain locker. I may say to, uh, to my uh, shipmates, I'm heading off to the rain locker. Rain locker is a shower. Uh, that is the rain locker. So here is, the, uh, is one of the showers on board Battleship Wisconsin. This one is in the head of the, uh, the, officer's, uh, the officer's head on board the ship on the O1 level. The rain locker is the shower. So another, uh, another word that we use in the, uh, in the Navy uh, specifically would be uh, rack. A rack, of course, is a bed. Uh, so this is my rack, this is my bed uh, rack. It's also referred to sometimes as a bunk. It may even be called in some cases a tree. Uh, if you happen to be in enlisted birthing, you'll notice that there's a lower, a middle, and then an upper uh, rack. Sometimes the uh, sailors that sleep in that highest, that upper rack, uh, will refer to it as a tree. So I'm going to go climb in my tree to catch some Zs because it's so high up there. They, uh, they're climbing into a tree. A lot of the language that sailors use on board ships uh, refers to animals. Uh, now, of course, you don't find many animals, if any, other than mascots on board ships. Uh, back in the days of sail, of course, you would have had some livestock, but uh, sailors named a lot of different pieces of equipment and tools that they use after animals. Uh, one is the foxtail. If I tell a sailor to go and get a foxtail, uh, he or she will know that their job that I'm going to have them perform is sweeping the deck in a small area, and the job will also require a dustpan. No fancy name for this, still a dustpan, but the foxtail is used in conjunction with the dustpan just to sweep up the deck. Another animal that we have on board the ship that is very prevalent uh, throughout the ship is a dog. And when we have a dog, we also need a tool called the dogging wrench that goes along with said dog. The dog is the locking me mechanism to a watertight door. Uh, the dogging wrench would be the pipe that is found in the general vicinity of that watertight door. And what we do when we go to dog down a door, if you hear a sailor talking about dogging a door, uh, we'll use the uh, dogs to close the door. We'll close the door. We'll use the dogs to tighten down on that seal that's made with the rubber gasket and the knife edge, like I talked about in that 3M video. And the dogging wrench is then used to really wrench down and make sure that it is secure and uh, watertight. So there is the dog and the dogging wrench. So another item that sailors use on a regular basis, and all sailors know what this item is, uh, the Cadillac. Uh, it's called a Cadillac because as a young sailor, uh, when he or she gets into the Navy, get out, gets out to the fleet on their first ship, the only thing that they're qualified to drive is this uh, mop bucket. And uh, it is affectionately referred to as the Cadillac. So if I tell a young sailor to go and get a Cadillac, that young sailor will know exactly what it is that uh, he or she is in store for. In this case, a uh, Cadillac and a swab, and we're gonna swab the deck. Along with the particular words that sailors use to speak to one another, there are also phrases that we use in everyday language that have their origins in the golden age of sail. Now, the golden age of sail ranges from the year 1600 
all the way up to 1855. The majority of the, uh, the phrases, of course, come from that time period in there, and they are all from the British Navy or British merchants traveling uh, across the oceans. One of my favorites is to swing a cat. If I were to say that to someone today, what I'm referencing is there's not enough room around me to swing a cat. Uh, so I'm talking about a smaller condensed space, not a lot of room where I can actually swing a cat. The cat that we're talking about actually from the days of Admiral Nelson is a tool for punishment. Uh, the punishment being uh, to a sailor that is witnessed by the entire crew and it is used as a deterrent so that uh, other sailors will not follow the same path. This is the punishment for disobeying an order. Whatever the order may be, whether it's lawful or not, in the days of sail, it was irrelevant. An order is an order. And if the sailor disobeyed it and was caught, he would get the, uh, the cat of nine tails. The cat of nine tails is a four foot long whip. Uh, so it's four foot long, about this long or so. Half of it, two feet, is the handle. The other half is leather, uh, nine leather uh, straps with a knot tied at the end. And the sailor would be flogged or whipped or lashed, depending on which word you use. Uh, he'd be tied over a uh, barrel and flogged using the, uh, the cat of nine tails. And this always had to be done on the main deck because there was not enough room below decks where the bosun mate could actually get a good swing in and cause the most amount of damage to the receiving sailor. That is one of those phrases. Another phrase that got its origins on the, uh, the warships of the British Navy back in the days of sail is piping hot. So everyone knows today, of course, if I were to tell you that the meal is piping hot, it's hot. You know, there's, there's no other way to explain it. It's just hot. But where does the piping hot come from? And that, of course, is the British Navy. On smaller ships, uh, when, the, uh, when the cook was preparing food, the crew on board the ship could smell it uh, as it was cooking, and they could pretty much tell when the meal was done. They would also be able to hear the cook yell, come and get it, uh, so they would know then that it was time to eat. On the much larger warships that, uh, that the British Navy started using, that wasn't, always, uh, that wasn't always the case, where sailors could smell the food or hear the, uh, the cook. So it was then the, uh, the bosun's uh, job to let the crew know that it was time for the meal. Now, one of the tools of the trade for a bosun's mate is the bosun's pipe or a bosun's whistle. And there is a special whistle in the Navy that is used for calling the crew to the mess decks to eat. Uh, this whistle would be, uh, would be played for the crew by the bosun on the main deck, and that... Uh, that high-pitched shrill uh, would be heard throughout the ship, and then the entire crew would know that it was time to eat. The call that was used was piping hot. Uh, so that's where that, that phrase, piping hot, comes from. Another phrase that's used in, uh, in very common practices is slush fund. Most everyone knows uh, they've heard the word slush fund at some point in time, or the phrase slush fund. And in today's world, a slush fund, of course, is cachet of money that I may have snaked away or stored away for a rainy day or uh, an emergency of some kind, but that's what the slush fund is in today's world. Uh, in the days of sail on board the ships, the cooks who were assigned to the galley, they were, they were at one point uh, able-bodied seamen, and at some point in time, maybe they got too old or they got hurt or something like that, they couldn't be uh, they couldn't be used and considered as able-bodied seamen any longer, uh, but they didn't know anything else other than going to sea. So they would then be uh, they would then be hired on as the ship's cook. The pay is not as much as a able-bodied seaman is, so they were able to augment their salary, so to speak, their pay, with different things. One of them is by way of this cauldron here. So sailors, when, uh, when the food was being prepared, the easiest way to cook meat is to put it in a cauldron and boil it. The boiling of the meat will render the fat off of the meat. The meat is then taken out, served to the crew. What's left behind is a mixture of fat residue and 
water. Some of the water has evaporated away in the form of steam, so we've got a fairly thick slush that's at the bottom of this cauldron. The ship's cook would then, when it cooled off a little bit, uh, package it up in a bucket. He would be able to take it into town and sell it to the candle maker. Uh, the candle maker would use it to make candles with it. He could also take it to a ship's rigger and uh, sell it to them. When that slush is mixed with linseed oil, it makes a very good grease to be used on uh, block and tackle. So he's selling all that, that slush to those different organizations or those different uh, occupations. And the money that he would collect in return would be referred to as his slush fund. Another phrase that's used in today's world and is fairly common, I think, with most everyone, uh, if you've never used it, at least you've heard it, is uh, flogging or beating a dead horse. In today's world, of course, is trying to revive an argument that is believed to have already been settled or trying to bring up uh, something in the past so that we can hash it out and argue about it again. The flogging or beating a dead horse had nothing to do with any of that whatsoever. When a sailor was signed to work aboard a ship, be it a merchant ship or a warship, but typically a merchant ship, uh, when he was signed aboard, he would get paid in advance, uh, usually up to two months pay. Uh, and this was paid when he signed on board and he was paid in cash uh, before the ship left port for the first time. Usually the sailor would spend all that money that he was paid up front on the different vices that sailors have. And then the, the ship, of course, would go out to sea and he would spend the first month or two, most likely, not getting paid but doing the work. Uh, this was looked at as working for free and uh, being a fruitless labor, in essence, is what it was referred to as, because they're not getting paid for the work because they've already been paid, but what's already happened has, uh, has left the sailor's mind. When the two months are up and the sailor starts getting paid now for the work that he's doing on board the ship, the fruitless labor is now over and a effigy of the fruitless labor comes in the form of a horse. Uh, the horse is made of canvas and stuffed with straw and he, the horse is paraded around the main deck, uh, usually hauled up the, the mast and then cut loose and thrown over the side. Uh, this ceremony is uh, beating the dead horse, and it just signifies that the sailors are now getting paid uh, for their work. So right now we are outside of the Hampton Roads Nail Museum, and one of the phrases that, uh, that is talked about sometimes, sometimes it's used in, uh, in everyday language, would be three sheets to the wind. If you've ever heard of three sheets to the wind, of course, you'll know that uh, someone is referring to someone being extremely drunk. Now, being drunk and being a sailor, they kind of go hand in hand for most folks. That's what they think of sailors. Uh, they just think of drunken sailors. But being three sheets to the wind, it doesn't so much have anything to do with drinking as it does with the square rigging of the ship. So a sheet on a square rigged ship is this area down in here. It's where the sail is attached to the spar uh, with a rope in that corner. And the sheet is used to help catch the wind in the sail, and it also is used to help steer uh, the ship. If a sheet comes loose, then we have a loose sheet, and it is a sheet to the wind. If we have three of them, go loose, we then of course have three sheets to the wind and the ship cannot be steered properly and it makes a ragged course uh, through the water. That in turn mimics a drunken sailor, a very drunken sailor, making a staggered walk down the street when he's returning back to the ship from Liberty. So that is where three sheets to the wind comes from. Here again inside the Hampton Roseneo Museum, uh, we're going to talk about the phrase a loose cannon. So in today's world, of course, a loose cannon, everybody knows that one. A loose cannon is someone who is outspoken and uh, very, uh, very adamant about their position or stance on whatever the subject may be. In some political circles, a, to be a loose cannon would be someone in a particular political party that does not necessarily toe the party line. 
But uh, a loose cannon in the days of sail is literally just that, a loose cannon. So a cannon on board a ship would be its main armament, like Battleship Wisconsin has the 16-inch guns. Uh, warships, uh, days of sail, would have cannons, not necessarily of this size, they'd be a little bit bigger, but uh, the cannons could recoil uh, up to 50 feet uh, in length. So once we fire it, it'll recoil back uh, 50 feet. In a ship that's only 55 feet wide, in some cases, uh, a cannon flying loosely across the deck may injure a lot of people. So using block and tackle and ropes, they will absorb that recoil on the, uh, on the cannons. If, for some reason, the block, tackle, and or rope breaks, and the gun is fired and all of that breaks, we now have a loose cannon on the deck. And it causes the havoc, it wreaks the havoc that, uh, that I just discussed. It's gonna go flying across the deck. Uh, it may take out a few things along its way, uh, in particular sailors who aren't, uh, aren't exactly paying attention to that, uh, cause a lot of damage. And that is where the term or phrase loose cannon comes from. Another phrase that's used, uh, that's used rather frequently in today's world here on land is taken aback. Uh, to be taken aback, of course, in today's world is to be surprised by the outcome or a statement made by someone. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm surprised, I'm taken aback uh, by what that man just said. But in the days of sail on sailing ships, to be taken aback is actually a very dangerous thing. Uh, to be taken aback is a phenomenon where the wind that is blowing the ship in one direction, um, in the forward direction, it's being caught in the sails by the sheets. Uh, and uh, the phenomenon is where now the wind has shifted and is blowing against the, uh, the sails. So we have, imagine here we have our tall sailing ship and the, the, rig, the sails are rigged and they're down and where now the wind has shifted from blowing that way, it's now blowing this way, and it is blowing the sails into the rigging, the mast, the yard arms, the spars, and this can be exceptionally dangerous. It's, it's dangerous to the, the rigging itself, is dangerous to the sail, and it can be dangerous to the crew because they've got to go up there and put all this stuff away uh, while fighting against the wind that is blowing in that direction. So that is the actual origin of the term taken aback. One term that I didn't want to, uh, I didn't want to not include in this is a fairly common one uh, among sailors and non-sailors alike because of its uh, connotations, and that is landlubber. I, being a sailor, would look at someone who is not of seafaring stock to be a landlubber. In the days of sail, there actually were, at times, non, non-seamen, non-seafaring type men that were brought on board ship. Uh, these uh, landsmen, as they were referred to, were brought on board specifically for their brute strength. Uh, we get a group of them together and they could do a lot of the heavy work, the heavy lifting. So if we're lo lowering an anchor, we're raising an anchor, we're putting up bars, we're putting up the, uh, the mast, we're putting up the, uh, uh, the sails, they would be employed on the ship to do those heavy lifting. They were looked upon, these landsmen, they were looked upon by the able-bodied seamen on the, on the ships as being unskilled oafs. So the original term oaf is of Germanic uh, origin and the word was lob. I add another B and a E-R-S to that and I get lobbers. I put land in front of it, I get land lobbers. Landlubber, uh, because the sailors uh, degrade all the words that they're put in contact with, and it then turns into landlubbers. So a landlubber in the days of sail was an unskilled landsman who was on board a ship for, for heavy lifting, uh, unlike where you would think it's just someone who is unskilled or unfamiliar with going to sea. So thank you very much for joining me today on this Whiskey Wednesday virtual adventure. Uh, please, when you come to, uh, come to Nauticus, visit, of course, the Battleship Wisconsin, but uh, stop inside here at the Hampton Roads Nail Museum. Uh, it's a really cool place. They've got a lot of history uh, going on in here for British Navy, uh, American Navy. They cover the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, and, uh, and they've got traveling exhibits around inside the museum as well. So please come out and visit us all. 
and we look forward to seeing you. Thank you.